Today we are in chapter 6, section 1. We're going to talk about how prices work. Um, prices are the things that we have to label, what we're going to how we're going to consume items, uh, things uh, you need to think of, something you or your family has recently purchased. Uh, whatever you purchased, was the price clear and it was easily identified? Would you have paid more for it if you had to? If the price was lower, would you have bought more? Did the price of a competing brand affect your decision? And would you have shopped elsewhere if the product was cheaper there? These are questions we answer on the regular every single day, um, depending on the market or what we're looking for, um, whether it be something like a computer or a car, well, even down to something like pop or groceries in the uh, regular supermarket. Uh, price is the monetary value of a product, and it asks, acts as a system of signals, uh, functions as an incentive, meaning that the physical paper that we use, the, the actual paper we use, has more value than it actually is, meaning we have our faith in it. Um, I think back to, you know, prior to the Gilded Age, when every piece of dollar, or uh, every a minted dollar that we had in the United States was backed up by gold um, in Fort Knox, which was basically we had for every piece of, uh, for every dollar we had a piece of gold to back it up. Uh, now, uh, in today's modern society, our, our, our value of money is it just in the faith of what we have in the government, meaning that what they tell us is worth, we have faith that our government is strong enough to maintain that. So that's how we use it as a medium of exchange. That's why we don't use chunks of gold or we're not carrying around things like that um, that would be different. You know, look into Africa with seashells or uh, things of that nature. So prices are used as signals. Uh, give information to buyers and sellers. High prices, the buyers want to buy less, but the producers want to produce more. This is that same idea of supply and demand where we hit at equilibrium. Uh, low prices, the buyers want to buy more, but the producers want to produce less, meaning I'm not as willing to produce it if I don't have as much of it um, to go around. So prices serve as an incentive which causes us to take action or take additional action, meaning, so if a price is there, think about, you know, if you were going to buy a bottle of Pepsi um, and you went to the store and you bought a bottle of Pepsi and you see that they're on sale, um, you know, and usually it's a dollar fifty for a bottle, this week on sale for 99 cents, typically what would happen is you'd stock up and you'd buy more um, because you have the option to be able to use it. Um, same sense as if you were going and you wanted to buy and stock it up and you went there and all of a sudden it was $1.69, which is more than what the regular price is, you're going to say, well, maybe I'm just going to buy one or two to get me by um, and then hopefully I'll be able to find a sale price in the future so then I'm able to buy more. The advantages of uh, price, and this is the book gives you uh, four different um, examples. On uh, neutrality, it says it favors neither producers or consumers. Um, in a competitive market economy, prices are neutral because they uh, favor neither the producer nor the consumer. Uh, since prices are the result of competition between buyers and sellers, they represent the compromises uh, that both sides are willing and can live with. All right, so neutrality means that, you know, I'm okay with selling it for this much and you're okay with buying it. Um, think about, like, you know, if you were buying a dirt bike on Craigslist or th uh, something like that, um, you know, the bike is for sale, you're willing to make an offer. If you're willing to come close to what they're asking, typically the seller is going to be able to um, maybe lower the prices and be able to, to meet you somewhere. Flexibility. Um, with that, that means prices in the market economy help provide flexibility. Unforeseen events such as natural disasters can affect the prices of different items. So, you know, thinking about like if something happened um, where water, you know, you're buying a gallon of water for 59, 69 cents. If they knew there was a hurricane coming, the prices of those water or the bottles of water could typically go up because we know that it, it might be in more demand. So, um, again, people will be willing to pay a little bit more uh, than what they're actually paying for it now. Um, you know, those are those are kind of those absorbed. Those uh, they're different kinds of shocks. Uh, that's one the strength of the price in the market economy, meaning that we're willing to pay that. Um, you know, a good example. I, I remember after September 11th. Um, you know, this is how to date how old I am. Um, driving home, I was at, at a college class, and I remember seeing the gas prices after September 11th were six, seven dollars a gallon, um, when they were just around around a dollar 25 before that. So you saw um, that flexible price. Familiarity is also another um, advantage of price. Uh, most people have known about prices all their lives. As a result, prices uh, are familiar and easy to understand. Um, there's no different, like, you know, idea of what this is going to be. Like, we know exactly what it should cost and what we're willing to pay for it. There's also efficiency, um, which means there's no cost of administration. Um, what that means is competitive markets tend to help produce uh, products find their own prices without 
outside help or interference. So there's not bureaucrats that need to be hired or committees that are formed. They don't have to pass laws. We, we know that we'll be able to figure out what do we need um, in order to be able to purchase or buy things. So what I want you to do is imagine what it was like if we did not have prices. You know, what would life be like? How did society determine who gets what? Uh, what problems could arise? And what, what would we use to replace prices? You know, think back to ancient societies. How did we get the things that we needed to do um, in order to be efficient? Um, so criteria, characteristics um, used to make a decision or a judgment. And when we're talking about criteria, um, it, it's the concept of, you know, things are sometimes far-fetched, but command economies, you know, they need criteria to answer questions. Uh, for example, when the Baltimore Order uh, played an exhibition game in Cuba in 1999. There was not enough stadiums and seats for all the local uh, baseball fans who wanted to attend. So Cuba's prime minister at the time, Fidel Castro, solved that for whom question by giving seats to the Communist Party members, whether they were baseball fans or not. Uh, so th this whole idea of, of characteristics used to make a decision or a judgment. In this case, you're talking about a, co a command economy. Somebody made the decision for us instead of having us being able to figure out that pricing. Uh, rationing, a system under which the government decides everyone's fair share. Uh, people receive a ration coupons, tickets, or receipts that entitle them to obtain a certain amount of a product. I think about rationing books um, when you look at history, um, specifically World War II, um, when there was a uh, shortage after the Great Depression of certain products. We had a ration to make sure that everybody was taken care of, that we were able to get the equipment that we needed for the military, but in the same sense have people be able to have the ability to survive. The problem with um, rationing, of course, is there's a perceived fairness. Um, there's also administrative expense, distorted incentives, and abuse and misuse. So I'm going to give you a little bit of those backgrounds off there. Um, the first thing to say is the perceived, perceived fairness. And what that means is, you know, uh, the debate over fairness begins immediately. People who live in small towns think that they should have more coupons because they don't have the same access as people who live in large areas. So how could they, you know, justify making these multiple trips to the store when they should you know when they should have more opportunities so that's again perceived fairness where do I live how is that going to influence me um, administrative expense and what they're talking about in that aspect is going to be the administrative cost of rationing uh, it's someone who has to pay the, for the printing and distribution cost of these coupons and it can include the salaries of workers and all the bureaucracy behind it and there might be review, review boards to make sure that, that if there's a conflict of how um, how that uses because if we don't have money to buy things and we're just giving out our, our, our percentage of, of our share that's going to make it a little bit more uh, distorted again a distorted incentive uh, rationing programs are specifically designed to take place of supply and demand um, and that's going to be saying that, you know, none of the incentives that are going to be solving this, the basic problem of too much or too, I mean, too little supply and too much demand, um, meaning that where's the incentive for us to produce if we're not able to make money or um, gain some way? With, without that, we're going to have a dis, uh, distorted incentive. There's also the idea of misuse or abuse. And no matter how much we take care of, um, coupons can be stolen, or they can be sold, or they can be counterfeited. Um, looked at the system of you know rationing when it comes down to food stamps. Um, how many times have there been fraud or neglect in the system that doesn't let us do it? So um, what us, our government does is, again, they create more administrative expenses because they create more, more bureaucracy to create, um, you know, instead of having actual food stamps, now you have a debit-style card, which is able to... Um, tell you what you're going to do, but th again, the misuse and abuse could be maybe you give that card to somebody else and somebody else is using it, um, therefore you're really not, um, you know, trading that product or using that ration the way it's, it was intended to do. So prices as a system. Um, it is an efficient way to allocate resources. It impacts supply and demand for products. It determines what products producers will make and helps individuals make decisions. So again, you look at it from the, the whole concept of if I know what the price is, I know what I need to make, I know whether it's a good deal or not because I could compare it to competition, and then I make an educated decision on buying that. So when I look at things like cars, how do I purchase that car? Um, how, what would I buy? Um, for instance, you know, you, you know that a car like a Mercedes-Benz is going to be more expensive because it has that name value. Um, compared to a Honda, very comparable cars in, in, in expense costs, but the difference is, you know, what's the difference of the warranty? What's the difference in the cost of maintenance? What's the cost of upkeep? Things that you have to learn of the system because you have to say, what price am I going to pay? Maybe short term, that might be a, the same deal, 
but maybe long term you look at it, it might add up to more of an expense over the long run. So you need to make sure that your system is in place and that you have all the um, educated information to make the decision that's right for what you uh, need. So prices help to determine a few things. Uh, this chart is in your book, but I want to go through it because I think it does a great job of where, going where we need to go. So it determines what to produce um, because companies will not sell what does not make a profit. An example is Volkswagen's turbo diesel engine. It cost too much to produce, so they decided not to make it. Even though their turbo diesel engine was extremely popular, the cost was there was too high, so therefore the profit was not readily available, so they decided that they needed to cut that. How to produce. The cost of labor and raw materials affects how things are made. So some manufacturing jobs have moved from the United States to China where labor costs are lower, meaning that we make a decision that, you know, we're going to take this company overseas because we could get cheaper labor, um, meaning that our actual overhead is going to go down, and therefore how we're going to produce it is we're not going to use American workforce. Um, and for whom to produ produce? Um, only for those who can afford to pro a product will buy it. So for an example of this is, again, it's only 672 private jets were sold in 2012 because, again, if there's not money or demand out there for it, these companies wouldn't have to make it. So this very small number of private jets, which is still a lot because that's a lot of very wealthy people who can afford private jets, but that number is so small and it's so minute that these companies need to make sure that they're creating the things that are going to make them profit for them. Meaning that how much research and development is going to go into something if you're only going to sell 672 of them in the course of the year? Well, the answer is it could be a lot because it depends on how much profit they're making off of each item because it goes back again to what and how are they producing it. Meaning that with only selling 672, if I produce it cheaper, then I'm going to be willing to make more.